And so we've got Gabrielle Lobbia of the University of Leeds, who will be talking about distributive laws for relative monads. So, off you. <laughs> Thank you, John, for inviting me and for introducing me. Today, as, um, as John said, I will talk about distributive laws for relative monads. And this talk is based on a preprint that I put on the archive this summer, I think in August at the start. And, and yeah, the, the main point of this paper was to find um, um, a notion of distributive law between a monad and a relative monad. And the main theorem of this paper is to prove a back-like theorem for this kind of distributive laws. Um, in the paper, I studied the case of relative monads and monads in a general true category. But for this talk, I would just talk about uh, the categories of the category of locally small or small categories, uh, just because it's a bit e more easy. Uh, it's easier to talk about this case, and um, I think it it already gives out a bit of the idea um, of what what was the work? Okay, so what we will talk about is, well, I will start reviewing a bit of distributive laws uh, for just the monads, so how two monads interact with each other. Then I will introduce relative monads, um, just the standard notion of relative monads. And finally, I will talk about what I called relative distributive laws. Again, distributive, that are the counterpart of distributive law when we talk about a monad and a relative monad. Okay. Um, if you have any question, please interrupt me at any point um, in, in any way you want to. Okay, so let's start with distributive laws. So distributive laws, well, as the name suggests, they want to generalize the notion of distributivity. And so more specifically, well, Think about um, the distributivity in, uh, in rings. And so in rings, we've got two monads, the one of groups and the one of, uh, the one of uh, abelian groups and the one of monoids, that they interact with each other with this distributive law. So distributive law are exactly describing how two monads interact. And um, more specifically, and the distributive law is natural transformation from ST to TS, and this weird twisting I will explain in the next slide why we've got this change of composition, let's say. Um, and obviously we need some axioms, and the axioms are these four axioms that can look a bit scary, but actually if you look at them, they are not um, super scary because the first one, for example, it tells you that the distributive law act in a nice way with respect to the multiplication on S. So you see we've got the multiplication of S on the left or on the right, and we've got the distributive law messing things around. And then the second axiom tells us that the distributive law acts nicely with respect to the unit of the first monad. And then we've got two dual axioms saying the same things for T. So the one about multi the multiplication on T and the one of, about the unit of T. Um, so I was saying, like, let me explain why this twisting and this uh, natural transformation from ST to TS makes sense. So first of all, as I was saying, you need to think about distributed law as generalizing. Uh, the distributivity in rings. So what, what it makes sense to ask is when, whenever we have a distributive law, we want a monad structure on the composition, TS. And here, if we think about this, it makes sense why the, the natural transformation D has to have this sort of typing. Why? Because if you want a multiplication on TS, well, we want a natural transformation from TS composed with TS, and then we want to get to TS again. And so what this twisting of the two monads gives us 
is that we can change the, the composition here and then we get t squared using d and then we get t squared and s squared and then we can just multiply them in any order we like because likely here everything comes in a nice way uh, and then the unit is just the composition of the two units so you see here why this st to ts neutral transformation is needed Moreover, Beck proved this really nice theorem, proving that a distributive, having a distributive law is the same as having a lifting of t to, to the s algebras, meaning a functor from an endofunctor of the, the, the category of the s algebras, um, which is a monad and e, like the monad structure on uh, on the lifting is given by the monad structure on t. That's what it means to be a lifting. And then it's also the same thing as adding an extension to the Claisley. And be careful because here, so this is a distributed law of t over s, and we get a lifting of t to the s algebras, but then we get an extension of s to the Claisley of t. So it changes the the direction or in general what like it's important the order of the two monads and then finally um, we also have an equivalence with a monad structure on the composition ts which is compatible with smt which means just what we would expect it means that the multiplication and the unit of this monad uh, are given in some sense from by the, the multiplication and units in SMT. So what's the usual strategy here to use this theorem? So usually in um usually we we first find the lifting. So we got two monads, we find a lifting of one monad to the algebras of another monad, because usually we just like we've got nice characterizations of the category of algebras of the monad. Then, thanks to this theorem, we had a distributive law. And then, using this distributive law, we can uh, find an extension to the Claisley category of the other monad, and also, if you want, um, the composite monad. Again, I mean, this is the usual strategy. Obviously, it's not the only way that you can use this theorem, but just to give you the idea of what usually happens. So let's see an example to motivate, to, to see how this thing uh, go. So let's take the power set monad and the monad of monoids. So the power set monad uh, as multiplication, which is given just by the union of subset of like subsets of subsets. So you do just the union on all the subsets that you get. And the unit is just the singleton. And the monad of monoids is the monad generated by the free adjunction uh, of monoids. Okay, so we've got uh, that the S algebras, well, are just, the, it's the category of monads. And the Claisley category of P instead is the category whose objects are sets and morphism are relations. You can check this, it's not uh, very difficult. Uh, or in general, if you want, I can explain. Now, let's consider P. We can find a lifting of P, of this monad, to the category of monoids. In what way? Well, we would do what we would expect. So to find a lifting, we need to take a monoid, M, and then we need to endow the power set of M with a monoid structure. And what we do? Well, we take two subsets, of M, A and B, and we define the product as the subset given by the multiplication of any element A and B with A in A and little b in big B. You can check that this actually gives you a lifting, and thanks to this lifting, we know, thanks to the theorem, we know that there is a distributive law that goes SP to PS because we have got the lifting of p to the s algebras in particular if you want um 
the distributive law would be given just by this function. So let's just see it a bit more clearly. Well, SPX is the free is the underlying set of the free monoid generated by the uh, the power set of X. So it's just words with letters that are subsets of X. And then we want to assign an element of PSX. PSX is um, the power set of the, the underlying set of the free monoid generated by X. And so, well, we just do the, the only thing that we could do, meaning that we take all the words that we can write with letters in each subset. So we take a one AM, any kind of words, word of this form with AI in big AI, which is a subset of X. Again, you can check with calculations that this is actually um, a distributive law. And actually you already knew because you already checked that, that uh, the lifting, that we had a lifting to the algebra. And uh, this, remember, try to remember this example because you will come back when we will talk about relative monads. Well, I told you that distributed laws generalize the idea of the distributivity in rings. So I thought that I could also give as, as an example exactly this. So let's take the monad of abelian groups and let's take the monad of monoids. So Sx would be just words and T of X would be these formal sums of elements of X. And then we can find a distributive law in, well, using the distributivity. Uh, this is a weird uh, map and it's a bit confusing maybe as if you just look at it, but what it really means is that we are just applying the distributive law that we know that should hold for rings. And the nice thing is that if you check, like you can check that this actually gives um, a distributed law, you, it satisfies the axioms, and the composite monad is exactly the monad of rings. Nice. Any questions about distributive laws? Okay, so let's go to relative monads. Okay, first of all, why do we even care about relative monads? Like monads are nice, why should we complicate the theory and get some generalization? So let's look at a really nice construction in category theory, which is the one of pre-shift. So if we take a small category, C, and we construct the pre-shift of, uh, of it, well, we don't get a small category, we get a locally small category. And and you could wonder why would this be a problem? Well, it's not a problem, but the pre-shift construction has some properties that are similar to the one of monad. Why? Because for example, profanitors, if you know what, what I mean with this, well, they look like what would be the closely category of this if this would be um, a monad or better a pseudomonad because we've, we, we raised the dimension. And, and also with like can extensions and stuff like that, we, we've got something that is a multiplication, but it's not really a multiplication because we don't have an end of functor. And so relative monads helps us to generalize the notion of monad to functors defined on subcategories. At least at the start, they, they use this, like they use always functors defined on subcategories. More in general, and also in my paper, I don't consider subcategories, but I just consider not end functors. Like what if we want a monad structure on something that is not an end of functor, but it's just a functor. Um, and the sort of aim, it's not what I got, but the, the aim of all of this work is to try to arrive to a new version of distributed loads describing what happens when we consider today's convolution product. 
because the deconvolution product is gives us sort of um, a lifting of this well relative pseudomonad, which is the um, the um, the power the the um, the, the pre-sheaf construction to the monoidal categories. Um, here with mon and big mon, I mean the, the category of small uh, monoidal categories and locally small monoidal categories. So yeah, like the aim of all of this work is to try to describe this situation um, with a notion of the right notion of distributed law. Oh, okay, let's go back to the power set moment to give an example and why should we care another reason why some people could care about relative moments. As I said, the class of the category of P is the category of sets and relations, which is a useful category, and P algebras are sub semilattice, which is another nice interesting category but what what happens if we want to restrict our sets and we don't want all sets but just sets up to a certain cardinality so what if we want to put an upper bound on the cardinality or even what if we want to consider a set theory where the power set is not a set but it's actually a class um, well, power set would not be an end functor anymore because if you take the power set of something that is has cardinality smaller than kappa, you go on to something that is greater than kappa uh, for kappa cardinal, infinite cardinal. And the solution again is considering the relative monad, and we will see how uh, we can see the power set as a relative monad. Okay. Let's finally define what a relative monad is. So first of all, we consider I a functor from C naught to C. If you want, you can consider C naught as a subcategory of C, but you will see that we don't really need this assumption. It's just historically they started as subcategories. Maybe there is a reason why there should be a subcategory. I just don't know, and everything works out if I is just a functor. So I, I, I felt like I shouldn't take an assumption that I didn't need. So we define a relative monad over this functor as, well, first of all, we want for any object in C naught, we want an object in C. Um, careful, we don't, wanna, we don't need a functor. We just want to assign on objects. Then, um, for any pair of objects in C naught, we want this family, we want this function. We want this function which takes a morphism in C from i x to t, t y and gives back t x t y. It's sort of an extension, it's sort of like in the pre sheaf case would be the count extension. In, in this case, you can just see as this operation that takes a map from Ix to Ty and it extends it in some sense to Tx and Ty. And this family of functions should replace uh, the multiplication in moment. Then we want a unit because again, like we still want some sort of monad uh, structure and so we want a unit and for a unit we take again it's not a natural transformation it's just for any x in c naught we want a map in c from ix to tx and then well and then we want three actions we want three actions that are um that are associativity left unity and right unity and they're written in a weird way because you probably, if you just look at them, you wouldn't associate them with associativity, but they will correspond. And we will see how they actually, like these three axioms in some particular case, because as I was saying, relative monads, they generalize monads. And so 
we will see that when we restrict immunants, these free axioms will actually correspond to the associativity for the multiplication of monads, the left and right unity axiom. Um, okay, um, just an observation. We don't require T to be a functor, but actually from these axioms, we can recover a functorial, like we can recover a functor from, from these, notion, these axioms. And also T is not required to be a natural transformation, but actually we can prove naturality following from these axioms. Um, this is useful, for example, in computer science, I believe, because it's easier to compute something that is not actually required to be a functor, but then actually it's nice for, well, I guess the category theory that we actually get a functor here. Um, Okay, nice. So let's see some examples of relative monads. So, well, as I promised you, we got the power set, which becomes a relative monad. In what sense? Well, we have the inclusion, first of all, of sets with cardinality and maximum kappa into sets. And then we have the power set, which would be just a functor, which like if we restrict the power set to this subcategory, we still get a functor. And we can construct a relative monad in the following way. First of all, well, as unit, we just take the same because Ix would be just x because it's just the inclusion. And then the power set will be, well, the power set. And so we take the same unit as the monad case. So we send any element of x to its singleton. Then we need to find the extension. And to find the extension, we will use the, the multiplication that we know there is, because if we just consider set, we've got a monad. But here we don't have, we can't define a multiplication. So we define this extension. We get, we take f from ix to py. So it's just from a set into the power set of Y. And then we extend it in just taking the unit, meaning that we take a subset of X and then we take the union of all the image of all the elements of J. And you see like since the multiplication P of uh, the multiplication of the monad P was just the, was the union you see that there are some similarities. And, and the reason is because this structure of relative monad derives in some sense from the, the monad structure on P. Another, another example of relative monad is the following, which is sometimes um, called the vector space uh, um, a relative monad because if you take a, a, a field K instead of a ring, then the classly category of these would be the one of vector spaces for some reasons. But you can also just forget this and look at this as, so as, as a relative monad and you consider the inclusion as I of finite sets into sets. And then you take as your assign on objects, um, the, the functions from N seen as just a set into a ring and uh, R. And then you can take these as units and as extension. Uh, the unit is just the one sending every element of N, any I, between zero and N, to its characteristic function, if you want, meaning that we send i to one and everything else to zero. And then you can find an extension with this formula. Um, just trust me, this is a relative monad. You don't really need to, to see what, here why this is actually an extension, but you can, you can think about it and you can sort of imagine what this would, like, would, would look like. Okay, so, Okay, as I said, relative monads generalize monads. Let's see how. So, 
first of all, let me recall that this whole description of monads was given by Manes, I believe. Um, I could be wrong, but I, um, I strongly believe that the first one was Manes that introduced this new way to describe monads, not with multiplication, but with this sort of expansion. And in particular, we can see that relative monads, when we take the the i, so the sort of inclusion to be the identity, so c0 is equal to c, um, we get back monads. And in what way do we get back monads? We get back monads in, with these correspondence. So the multiplication will correspond to this extension, the associativity will correspond to this axiom, and then the left and right unit low will correspond to the, the other two that I brought. And this description was actually particularly useful to describe classly categories. Because if you see in this way, describing monads with this extension, these, these axiom will tell you the, the composition and why the composition in the Kleisler category is actually a composition. So it's, a, it's actually associative. And this too would be the ref and right unit low for the composition in the Kleisler category. Because, yeah, because when, when you work in Kleisler categories, you have morphemes from X to Y that are actually morphemes from X to S, Y. And then to compose them, you do you use this extension. So the, the original reason why these monads were described in this other way was to study Kleisley, the, the Kleisley notions in an easier way. Let's briefly see how to go from one to the other. So let's start with the monad and let's find the extension because the units will always be the same. So the only thing that we really need to, to see is how to go from a multiplication to an extension and vice versa. So if we start with the multiplication, then we can define the extension as, well, we start with a map from X to SY, and we want a map from X, X to SY. So we first do SF, so we go from SX to S squared y, because we apply the functor s to f, and then we just multiply with the multiplication of the monad to go back to s y. On the other hand, instead, if we have an extension, we can get back the multiplication um, considering the extension of the identity of s x. So here we need here we need the, um, this assumption that i is equal to the identity because monads can always be seen as relative monads but when we have a relative monad we need the the i to be the identity because when the i is the identity then here we can consider sx as an element of c because they are c naught and c are the same so sx being an end of functor um, we can consider SX, I mean, SX is an element of C. And so we can consider SX as, well, again, X. And so here we will have the identity of SX. And if we extend it, we will get an, a morphism from S squared X to SX. And using the, these three axioms, we can actually prove that this multiplication is associative and respects the unit, again with this correspondence. And these axioms are actually useful to prove that these constructions are actually inverse, uh, they are inverse of each other. Okay, good. Um, again, let me just say one once more that the reason behind this construction, this um, new way to describe monads that Manus gave was because of Kleisley uh, constructions and in particular the Kleisley category. And especially for this reason, 
you can construct also the classical category of a relative moment. So if you get a relative moment, you can consider the classical category to be the category with objects, the one in C note, not the one in C, but the one in C note. And as morphism, you consider the morphism in C from Yx to Sy. And and basically then you do what you're implying. So you use these as composition, like the extension will give you a composition and so on and so forth. So you can get a classly construction for relative monads. What you can also get is a sort of algebra construction. So, but in this case, you need to do to work a bit more because you don't have an end of functor, so it would be a kind of weird to, to require for a function from tx to x because, I mean, they don't, they, don't, they don't even live in the same category. So it's kind of weird. So you change the definition and you define a relative algebra, a relative t algebra, to be an object of C together with a sort of another operation, another operator, if you want, that in this case takes, for, so for any x in C naught, we want to map from the functions from i x into a to the, fun, the, the maps from t x to a. So again, we have a sort of extension. So we start from i x into a and we extend this map using this relative algebra structure to a map from tx to a. Um, and obviously this map, these, uh, these maps will have to satisfy true axioms that will be the corresponding axioms of the action of the algebra that has to respect the, the, the unit of the monad. And this is the first axiom, meaning that if you take the extension through a of h and we precompose with the unit you get back h and then you have a sort of um multiplicate like the, the action that will replace the one saying that the the action of the algebra has to respect the multiplication in t and this is the second one saying that if you have two maps of this type, and then you do these uh, operations, then the like this triangle will commit. Um, the nice thing that algebras give us is that, and this was proven by Alton Kirk Chapman and Ustaler, they give us a, a relative adjunction. So in, with monads, what we have is that we start with a monad we can construct an adjunction using the allenberg moore category of algebras. And on the other hand, if we start with an adjunction, we can go back to monads. So something similar happens for relative algebras, for relative algebras and relative monads. Because if you start with a relative monad, you will get, a, again, like a relative adjunction, which is the right counterpart of adjunctions in this case. And with the adjunction, but instead of adding two functors from like functor from C to D and a functor from D to C, you will have sort of a triangle with some properties. But just think that it's the, the right counterpart of adjunctions. And the nice thing is that if you start with a relative adjunction, then you also get back a relative monad. So you have a sort of the same situation, but instead of having adjunctions, um, you have relative adjunctions. And actually, if we consider the categories, you can also get a relative adjunction using the Claisley category of a relative gonad. Um, this is true when you consider categories, is not always true when you don't consider the true category of categories, but if you consider a general true category. Um, and this was, yeah, I wrote something about this uh, in the paper. 
Okay, so I think now we're ready to talk about relative distributed flows. If there are no questions, uh, if there are questions, I can go back. Okay, so let's talk about relative distributed loads, which again, they should be the counterpart of distributed loads between a relative monad and a monad. So we don't take two relative monads, but we take a relative monad and a monad. First of all, well, we need to find the right setting because it doesn't really make sense to talk about relative distributed loads in always, but we need the relative monad and the monad to interact in a nice way, some, in some sort of sense. Because for example, if we consider, like let's pretend that I is an inclusion. Then if you consider monad S on C, well, what we want, we want that S will restrict nicely to C naught. So if we consider C naught as a subcategory, we want that the restriction of the monad to the subcategory C naught would be a monad on C naught. And we want that the multiplication and unit will be derived from the, the monad structure on S. And so how we define this in for general for the general case, not just I the inclusion, we define the notion of a compatible monad with a functor I which is just a pair of monads, one on C naught and one on C, such that, well, they agree with I. So if you do ISI is the same as doing I as naught. So the, the diagram commute, and actually the diagrams with multiplication and a unit will commute as well. Uh, another way to see this is you get a monad on C naught, you get a monad on C, and then you require I and the identity to be a monad, fun, uh, a monad morphism. And to be a monad morphism in this case, when you consider the identity um, is exactly, that corres it correspond exactly to these three uh, accents. So what we will define will be a relative distributed low between a relative monad on a compatible monad SS naught with the um, with I. Uh, because it just makes sense to consider this situation. Okay, let's define finally relative distributed flow. So let's go back for a second to distributive lows, just the, the normal case. Um, what we had was, well, um, natural transformation, ST to TS. So we'll need something similar, but we need to be careful because T compose just like, we can, we have C naught and T will just, we can pre-compose T with S naught, but we can, and we, we have to post-compose T with S. So we'll need, be, need to be careful about this. And then we want to replicate these four accents. Two of them would be basically the same, but then T doesn't have a multiplication. So we will need to find a new accent for this one. So if we go back, relative distributed low, well, it would be a natural transformation D again from ST to TS naught, um, because here is the only typing that you can do such that we satisfy four axons and well the first two are basically the same as a normal distributed low because they just say that they that d respect the multiplication on s and also s naught so the only difference is that when there is an s on the right we need to put s naught and and the same for the unit of s and s naught and then we need to find two more accents for T. So instead of the action about the multiplication, we have an axiom, this one, about the extension of T. And then we have an action about the unit of T, which is just this one. Um, luckily, 
we get a back-like theorem for this situation. So we get that a relative distributive law would be the same as a lifting of T to the algebras of the compatible monad, which would be just a lifting of T. So it would be a relative monad on this. So on, from S naught, from the algebras of S naught to the S algebras. And then this is also the same as an extension of S, so the monad S to the classical category of T. Uh, just to give you an intuition on how the, the theorem goes, uh, I prove one, if not only if two, and this is just a direct proof with, a, with some calculations. Um, instead, the second one is similar to the, up, the approach that Street did with the formal theory of monads. And uh, if, if I have time, uh, John, do I have time? How much do I have? Yeah, I think you're muted. Yeah, you still have, say, 15 minutes, if you like. Ah, good, good. Um, yeah, I can give you, for those, Maybe all of you know what the formal fear of monads is, but if there are people that don't, I will give a rough explanation of how the, um, the proof goes. So in this case, we can also define a true category of relative monads that we call rel cut, because actually we can define the, um, the true category of relative monads in a general true category, but Let's not think about that for the moment. Then you define another true category of with objects, relative monads, and extensions um, to Kleisley as morphism. Um, be careful because extension to Kleisley in the relatives in, in this relative setting are a bit more tricky than in the normal setting. Like we need to add a few more accents. I will explain a bit in the, in the, in the next slide. But you can still find a true category um, with objects, relative monads, and extensions to Kleisler's morphism, and then also some transformation sort of things. Then you prove that these true categories are actually true isomorphic. You apply, you calculate monads inside these true, true categories. And what you observe is that, well, the objects of the true category on the right, on the left, are actually relative distributive lows for some calculations that you can do. You just try to compute a monad inside the true category of relative ca uh, monads, and you obtain exactly a relative distributive low. And the objects on the right are extension classes in the Beck uh, theorem kind of sense. And therefore, since you got this isomorphism here, or this equivalence here, then you get that these objects, they have to be the same. At least they have to be equivalent. So let me just point out some difference that we got from the usual distributed low case. So first of all, let me notice that in monad theory, in monad theory, there is a really nice thing, which is a duality, meaning that if we consider a monad in a true category, or we consider a monad in the opposite true category, we still get like a monad in the opposite true category is still a monad in K. Exactly because we've got an end of function and the multiplication acts nicely and everything is fine. With relative monads, we don't have that. And the reason behind this is because the extension really doesn't like duality. With extension, when we change the direction, extension just becomes something totally different. And so we don't have this duality. And, and that's the reason, for example, why in the back like theorem for relative distributive law, I had to prove one part on its own and the second part on its own. Instead, street, for example, there just proves one and then by duality proves also the other one. But in this case, I, I, we couldn't. 
Then, as I was saying, extension to Chrysler, uh, they're not, they're a bit tricky and we need to, to take some more actions. And two of them makes total sense because we consider the usual forgetful functor or the usual functor from the classical category of a relative monad, which is basically the same idea of the classical of the functor from the classical category of T to um, to C, and we require this to be a monad morphism, not just like we need to require this to get back a distributed low. And also we need to require that this functor, this T, like the unit of T, can be seen as a monad transformation. And also, um, so these in CAT, these two axioms are enough, but when you consider a general true category, you also need to, to add another axiom, which is a bit technical, so I didn't write it. Just to finish, we've got this situation. I wanted to tell you a bit of what's the situation with like relative algebras and relative Claisley construction in the general setting. So in the setting of a true category instead of the category of categories. Um, so relative algebras usually you also in the formal theory of monads you consider indexed left modules as relative algebras uh, as algebras. And so I, I, I did the same. I consider relative indexed left modules and relative indexed right modules that would give you some Claisley sort of construction. And the interesting thing is that they, you're not able to do everything with them, but you're able to do parts of the formal fear of monads with both of them. So for example, as I said at the start, with relative left modules, you get a relative adjunction and you get um, the, the theorem saying that if you have relative Allinger Moore objects, then any relative monad, monad is induced by a relative adjunction. But you don't get that for relative right modules. And the problem here is again connected with this duality, with the fact that duality does not agree with, oper with this extension operator. Uh, they really don't like each other. Um, on the other hand, the thing that I said in the theorem, like you've, using right modules, you can get a true category equivalent to the one of relative monads inside a true category, rel k called, but you cannot do that with left modules, which is interesting because, yeah, you see that you can do some things with one, some things with the other one, Likely, you can do a back-like theorem for both of them, and that was quite nice. Uh, do we have time for an example? Or uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Good. So, well, the example is a bit of a. Um, I'm kind of cheating here because I'm giving you the same example twice. One time for distributed loads and one time for relative distributed load. Uh, but, but it's a sanity check, so it's not bad. So if you consider the power set monad as well a relative monad instead of a, a, a monad, and we consider the monad of monoids, then we can see that, first of all, the monad of monoids restrict nicely to the category of set with an upper bound, an infinite cardinal kappa. That's because when you do the free construction of a monoid, uh, you're considering all the words of length and natural number. And so you're doing a countable union of all the set of words with length fixed. And all those sets have got cardinality maximum kappa. So in the end, you still get a set with maximum cardinality kappa if you start with obviously a set with that upper bound. And so this monad, like monad of monads, is a compatible monad with the inclusion of this category to the category of sets. 
and well, we do exactly the same. We do it exactly the same, and our our past distributed law in this case becomes a relative distributed law. Uh, here, there is a as a, a little cap I'm missing here, and and yeah, you can check the same axioms, and everything goes smoothly. Luckily. Um, and so, using the theorem, we can see that there is a lifting of the power set of relative monad to the inclusion of monoids with an upper bound on cardinality to just monoids. There also exists an extension of the free monoid monad to the category of relations over sets with cardinality um, maximum kappa. And yeah, let me just say that this example is also important because then. Again, the reason of all this work was to explain pre-shifts. And if we go one dimension lower, instead of pre-shift, we sort of get power set. So it was important to get this sanity check that like this whole thing worked in this, like in, in the dimension lower to at some point get uh, the dimension above. And also, you can check that uh, the other example of relative monad that I told you, that was this, this one with the um, functions from n to a ring or um, a field k. And if you consider these, like the classically category of this relative monad, again, would be sort of vector spaces in some sense. Um, in 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 the first part of the Alton Kirk Chapman and Louis Talo um, paper, monads need not to be endofunctors. I believe it's called. There is an explanation about uh, this relative monad that I'm that I'm describing, and the reason why its classical category is actually one of vector spaces. And so you can prove that there is a lifting of the pointed pointed sets monad. Uh, to the, um, there is a lifting of the relative monad, sorry, to the algebras of the pointed set monad. And therefore, there exists an extension of the pointed set monad to the Claisley category of the relative monad, which is the category of vector spaces. And I guess the algebras would be something on the line of pointed vector spaces, which maybe could be useful or maybe not. And there are possible uh, uh, possible future works, but I think I, I went a bit over time. So I will give you the, um, the paper, the, the, the references, and thank you for listening. OK, thanks very much, Gabrielle, for a nice talk. Um, yeah, so if... Uh, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and feel free to ask. Um, well, I have a question or I have a comment first. I like the example of the Parsev monad and the monoid monad. I've only ever seen people describe the two-dimensional version of it somehow. Um, they've never actually seen it written down. But, um, and well, my other question is maybe a bit confusing, but uh, you said that you can describe a two, two category of relative monads inside uh, any two category. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, then it seems like what you're describing is a monad inside the two category of relative monads. What do you mean? Well, so because you have your distributive laws consist of a monad and a relative monad. Yeah. Um, well, so my question is, uh, what is a relative monad in the two category of relative monads? Ooh, yeah, that, that's a question that I already got. And my answer is probably a mess. Uh-huh. But I mean, you have, I guess, a lax version or like, I guess you get something like you can just compute it and you can get something. 
but already like the, the the weird thing for example is that if you consider monads inside the true category of relative monads you get relative distributed laws but if you consider relative monads inside the true category of monads you get something else you get some i don't remember if it's bigger i think it would be bigger because you don't yeah because you have more like your unit has got more information than your like you don't have just a, a natural transformation d but you have a more like you have also a d naught or something like that okay so you you actually get more information if you took the relative monads inside the monads so if you get relative monads inside relative monads mm -hmm. that it will be interesting are you, are you saying that there's a distributive law of the relative monad monad over the monad monad <laughs> <laughs> anyway no it doesn't matter it just reminds me of this whole uh this whole straight story at the end of his paper um, the formal theory, formal theory of monads where he mm -hmm. views all these constructions as monads and so on but i'm cu still curious what a relative monad in the two category of relative monads is but I, i'll ask you about It'd it sometime yeah um i think i did some calculations at some point i need to find them but okay a any more questions Maybe I have a question. So, if a monad is a monoid in the uh, in the in the functors, so is there a similar theory for general monoids, like some distributive law of monoids and relative monoids? So, um, you can consider relative monads as skew monoids if you take some conditions on your categories. And this was done in uh, the Alton Kirk uh, Chap Chapman and Stalu paper. So I'm guessing in that case, yes. And if not, I think it would be a bit hard because, like, I guess if you can describe them both as sort of monoids, then you can just like go with the equivalence and find out what would be the distributive law. And so I, I'm guessing there there is a notion. I'm not aware if anyone has already done this, but I, th I think. Do you mean? Um, I think he, so. By a skew monoid, you mean you can view a relative monad as a monoid in a skew monoidal category. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly that. Yeah. It could be. It's sort of interesting. Well, you can also, for example, view an operatic category as a as um in terms yeah. of humanoid have, so it's a little bit like that i just thought i'd mention yeah yeah thank you oh yeah no go you you seem that you wanted to say something um, any other questions Well, if not, then let's thank Gabrielle again. So, thank you. Good. And uh, so that's it. That's the last seminar of the year, it, online seminar. And yeah, so I guess we can.